I want to go back to a familiar scripture. We've been talking about last week. I didn't get very far. I got far enough to let you go. Uh, but uh, I want to talk about our thoughts being dominated by God, dominated by God's thoughts, or, you know, our thoughts being dominated by God's thoughts. And that's what we've got to do. Uh, people say, well, you know, God told me this. And when they begin to tell me what God told them, I'm thinking, that's not God. That's totally contrary to how God operates. It's contrary to how God thinks. So we need to be dominated by God's thoughts. Amen. Jeremiah 29. Yeah. Woo. 29. Jeremiah. One of Angel's favorite verses. Look at look how this reads. 29.11. Now you can go in there and read all of the things that's going on. Uh, and uh, how God brought them out and his plan to bring them out of captivity. But verse 11, let's just dive into that. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. So God's got thoughts that he thinks towards you. You know, I hear people say all the time, I, I know what that person thinks about me. I know what that person thinks about me. How many has ever been paranoid about what you think somebody's thinking about you? People say, you know, I know what that person's thinking about me. You know, I've had people think things about me that wasn't right. I'm sure I've thought things about them that wasn't right. But how many knows that you've got to do something about your thoughts? But it's not so much what we think. We've got to know what God thinks about this. God said, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Or I like to say, to give you an expected end, something that you can look forward to. See, God doesn't have bad things in your life. God doesn't have bad things prepared for you. And God's not causing bad things to happen to you so he can teach you something. The Holy Ghost is your teacher, not problems. Problems come to steal the word of God. Mark is very clear about what happens. He says that God, that the enemy uses five things. I've never found six or seven. The Bible said there's five things that the enemy uses, according to the book of Mark, that comes and steals the word of God. He said, first of all, affliction, persecution, the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things come in to steal the word, to make it unfruitful. So these are things that the enemy uses to steal the word. I was preaching in a uh, missions conference years ago and one, uh, some people from a third world country that has gone through extreme persecution struggled with these verses that I was just preaching in that conference and they kept saying, I don't agree with the speaker on this meeting. I didn't really know him and I got to know him afterwards. They, I don't agree with it because it's the persecution to the church that's caused the church to be strong. Well, I don't agree with that either. I'm not saying it didn't work, but the church doesn't need persecution to be strong. The church can get strong by just walking with God. Well, I got it, you know, what for this cancer, I don't know if I'd be where I'm at with God. You could be. The cancer didn't come to draw you close to God, it come to kill you. The troubles didn't come to bring you closer to God, it come to destroy you. During that time, you drew close to God. During that time, you opened your heart to him, knowing that there's no other way out. So there's no sense giving that which came to kill you, the credit. You need to give the credit to the God that rescued you. Come on. If you're going to go through something, you ought to at least learn from it. But don't give what you're going through the credit It's just that you didn't really need that to get close to God. You could have got close to God on your own. I've said for many years to this fact, you know, when is it that God's people will start drawing close to him without problems pushing them to him? You know, I don't always want a problem or some cataclysmic destructive thing to happen before I feel like I need to draw close to God. We ought to draw close to God because he's a redeemer of our life because he planned my life. He has a hope and a future for my life and that all I have to do is say, yes, I'm yours to command and whatever you do, I'm saying yes to it again. That's the thing. That's how we walk with God. But 
God's thoughts, as we mentioned last week, are higher than our thoughts. And people say, yeah, you know, you never know what God's going to do. You know, I don't even like that. So if you're saying it, stop. You never know what God's going to do. Now, I may not know how God's going to do a certain thing, but God's going to do what God said he's going to do in his word. You never know what God's going to do. I know what God's going to do. He's going to set free. He's going to heal. He's going to deliver. He's going to bring life. He's going to provide. Come on. He's going to bring you out of the pit. He's going to put you on a higher place. I know what God's going to do. It's people I don't know what's going to do. I, God's pretty consistent. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's people that change. Come on. Some of you said you got in here. I'm so cold, I can't stand. I don't know if I can even stay. And now, now you're saying, where's that air conditioning? I don't even know. See, emotions change within just moments. You're cold one minute, you're hot the next. Because you change. God never changes. Your circumstances doesn't change God or anything else. God is always going to be the same. But God knows what we need. And he's already provided for everything that we need. Amen. So God, so you didn't happen just to happen. God had a plan for your life from the beginning and he gave you a hope and an expected end. So God saw your end from the beginning. I like that. Amen. Someone says, well, I remember the day that God called me into the ministry. No, when, when was that? Well, he was at that youth camp. Well, the youth camp is when he spoke to me. I've said that because I didn't know anything better, but that's not when it really happened. You know, I started asking people, I was in Uganda years ago, and, and I had Pastor Shipman with me, uh, Brother Wayne was with me, and uh, other people were, were w- with me during this time, and, and I started asking them questions. I was doing a morning devotion with them, and I said, uh, according to the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 6, and a lot of what I do you, when you do your birthday cards at times or whatever, I'd put this verse in there, or if I do something special, I'll write Philippians 1, 6. What is Philippians 1, 6? He which begun a good work in you will perform until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe God will perform it. So I sat in there that morning and doing this devotion with the team that I had with me overseas, and I said, when did God begin this good work in you? And one said, you know, I believe it happened when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Another person said, you know, I believe it happened when I got called to the ministry. Other one gave, uh, there was like four of us in that room, uh, four four besides me, and uh, they gave four four different answers. I said, well, I can go you back one better than that. Jeremiah said, the Lord knew me when I was in my mother's womb. Well, I can go back. Further than that, according to the book of Ephesians, it said that God already planned it before the foundation of the world. So it didn't happen just when you're in your mother's womb. God already had a plan for you. Turn to Ephesians 1. God already had this plan for your life. It's not, it's not something that uh, we just that sn- snuck up on us. God had this plan, and we need to begin to think like God thinks and position ourselves for what God has planned for us. You know, if you never prepare, that's why I love biographies about great missionaries and missionaries of old. And when I listen to them, uh, some of the ones that really felt early that they were called to be missionaries. uh, uh, The last one that I was listening to that felt that, and she was, she was single all the way to the end, was uh, Amy Carmichael, the great missionary to India. And she knew that God had called her to be a missionary. She started off in one area. She wanted to go to China to, to, to be with the great uh, Hudson Taylor. And, and she wasn't able to do it because her body was too weak. She didn't pass the exam. But she ended up in India. But all the time of getting there, she knew that God had called her to be a missionary. And even though she didn't know when, she didn't know where, she didn't know how, she started preparing herself for that day. So when that day came, she didn't have to start preparing. See, you've got to prepare yourself. That's like coming to church. The reason why some people don't get anything out of the church, you don't prepare yourself for church. You just show up. you got to prepare yourself for church. That means you get up, you uh, start cultivating your heart. Now I realize that some of you barely slide out of bed. And you barely, barely slide into the pew on time. You know, 
Until 2015, it was called Full Gospel Temple. I said back then, some people thought it was Bedside Temple (laughs) because they'd rather stay in bed than to be in the house of God. But you know, you, you... if you, want, if you want to get something out, you got to get something in. It's amazing. All the years that Josh played ball, from the time he was four years old, T-ball, when they played in the dirt more than they did anything else. <laughs> Even in T-ball, they showed up early. How many ever played Little League that you showed up at the time the game started? No one. How many showed up early when you played Little League, and especially when you play ball? Uh, you know, even when Josh played hockey, even though the other team was on the, on the uh, ice, they showed up early. They got things done. They showed up early. It's amazing to get ready for a game. They showed up early. They showed up to stretch. They, they showed up to throw. They showed up to do things. Basketball players show up early to go out to the court, you know, to shoot. We went down to the Reds game. We showed up early. We watched the batting practice. They didn't just come out of the dugout announcing the starting lineup. They were out there in batting practice. They were out there taking ground balls, doing all of the routine things. So when it was game time, they were already in the mode of game. And it's amazing on how effective you are when you show up ready, when you get ready before you come and we perform better when we're stretched out and ready to go. Come on. Now, you may not show up here. Josh always had to be there an hour early. So we knew what time to be there because we saw what time the game was. The game is going to be a... uh, on a Saturday morning, it's going to be a 10 o'clock game. We knew he had to be there by 9 o'clock. And the coaches were very firm. 9 o'clock. 9.01, you're late. Actually, 9 o'clock, you're late. But you had to be there. You had to be there. And uh, why? Because they wanted you ready to play. And I really believe the church of Jesus Christ could be a whole lot greater in the house if God's people showed up ready and put some effort into it before we got here. Come on, a little worship in the morning and uh, a little, you know, get yourself going. Some people say, well, I don't like the songs. You know, I like different songs. You know, in the morning before you get here, you can play whatever you want. (laughs) If bluegrass is your thing, worship to it. If hymns from the hills is your thing, go to the hills. (laughs) Indulge on whatever you like. Build yourself up. But we come to the house of God, let's be one together. And let's just serve God and worship God together. Come on. And if there's something else you like, play it on the way home. Don't fuss with your husband. I mean, wife. (laughs) Don't do that. Just fellowship with God. You know, warfare begins after the service. There's some before that. But it usually begins afterwards, you know? Why? Because the Bible said when the word of God is sown, immediately the thief comes to steal it. So you know it's going to be a little different when you get out. So just go ahead and have your heart all set that I'm going to have fun in here and I'm going to beat it all the way home. Amen? I'm going to beat it all the way until I beat the Baptist to the restaurant. Come on. It don't matter what happens. Glory to God. All right. Ephesians chapter 1. Are you there? Some of my favorite verses. I believe in this, I believe the day that the light came on inside of me pertaining to this. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Not just because some man wanted to apostolize him. He was by the will of God. He was apostle to the saints who were at Ephesus. So how many knows he was apostle to the, to the church at Ephesus? But also to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Well, that's me now. So I could take his apostle, his apostolic leadership because I'm also faithful in Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed, empowered. Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has blessed or empowered us with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual empowerment. In heavenly places in Christ. So I've had anti-prosperity people come back at me on this because I'm, I'm not going to preach poverty. But I don't beg for money either. When was the last time you saw me beg for money? 
Never. I don't see it. There's no need for it. But they like to attack the prosperity message on this and said, see, you guys look at blessings as something natural. And the Bible said he blessed you with all spiritual blessings. So why are you judging every blessing natural? I said, all right. So it is true. So if people said God promised me that he was going to give me a new house, once you got the house, was it a natural blessing or a spiritual blessing? It's natural. A car, is it natural or spiritual? Natural. And so they say, see, that's natural. This says spiritual. Well, you're right. Let me help you read. It said he blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in himself or in him before the foundation of the world. Folks, before the foundation of the world, there was nothing natural existing. He established it in the spirit and performed it in the natural. Sure was spiritual blessing because nothing natural existed yet. But what he did in heaven, it was going to be demonstrated upon the earth. What he did in one place was going to show up at another. Amen. He chose us in himself. When when did he choose you? When you're in your mother's womb? No. He chose you before the foundation of the world that you should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So this predestination is not, okay, he's, he's only going to predestine a certain amount of people that's going to make heaven. That's not the predestination. What this predestination is two words. Pre, as we experience at time, we have pre-service prayer. So that means it happens before the service. We have pregame warm-ups. Why? What is it? Before the game begins. We have prehistoric history. He was a, that's a prehistoric animal. Prehistoric. Pre is before. So predestination or predestiny. God determined and saw you and called you out in the pre because he had great thoughts towards you for your destiny. It's not just predestined. He is. He destined you to win in the beginning. Before the world began, he destined it already. He established, he designed it, he purposed it. So no one should ever walk around feeling like they were not created to win because he predestined your victory before you was even born. I like that, don't you? Hallelujah. Well, why, then why don't everybody live in it? Because he predestined or predesigned a system. That whoever comes to me will never be cast out, nor will they perish. But if you don't come to me, you don't get it. People say, well, how could a loving God send people to hell? He's not sending them to hell. He pre-designed a system that if you accept him, he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the presence of God. Or he'll say, depart from me, your work of iniquity, I I knew you not. He's not deciding on that day if you're going to make it or not. He predestined or pre-designed a system to work. And if you meet that criteria, you got it good. If you reject it, it's going to be a bad day in Dodge. Come on. It's not going to be good. So God called you out. Can you imagine that God already had a plan for your life? According to Ephesians, God already had a plan for your life. It wasn't for failure, but it was for victory. It wasn't for, it wasn't for death. It was for life. You know, people have said, and even this thing with Buddy, and I was there. I I, I knew Buddy's heart. You know, some people say, why didn't ever, why doesn't everybody get healed? Well, according to the book of Hebrews, some people, the Bible says emphatically that, that people escaped the edge of the sword. They did. They escaped the mouths of the lions. 
Women received their dead raised back again. Hebrews 11, start about 33. Women received their dead raised back to life again. They quenched the edge of the sword. They did all of these great feats. And it said, and others, others did not accept the deliverance, believing for a better resurrection. So that tells me that there was two classes of people, those who accepted it and those who did not. So I really believe in my heart when someone says about being a martyr, I believe a martyr is someone that accepted not, not, not the deliverance that is made available for them. They, they, they didn't accept it. Uh, according to the book of Hebrews, God made a way. There was two kinds of people, those who made it out. And I don't believe God chose that day that I'm going to deliver him and I'm not going to deliver you. That's just like saying God came to save you, but he didn't come to save this one. No, Jesus came to save all. He's not picking and choosing. He's, he, he's not a God of, of caste like they do in third world countries like India. And you got, you, you, you got the upper caste. You got the middle caste. You got, you got the untouchable. God don't operate that way. He says, I'll judge all equally and I'm going to die for all the same. That's the God that we serve. So when he says, I know the thoughts I have towards you. Thoughts of good, not of evil. To give you an expected end. I think if we really get a revelation of this, it'll stop the moaning and groaning. I don't know why God doesn't want me blessed. He does want you blessed. Why doesn't God want me healed? He does want you healed. Well, then why don't everybody get healed? I don't know. I'm not God. I just know Jesus didn't die for a few. He died for all. I know he was wounded for my transgressions. He was bruised from my iniquities. And yours too, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. I do know that. I don't know why everybody doesn't get healed. Somebody asked me, he says, why does bad things happen to good people? I said, well, why, why does good people go to hell? They don't accept Jesus Christ. They don't accept him. I think in these last days, we better understand how to tap into the delivering power of God. He is our deliverer. But you're not going to tap into something that you don't know the mind on. Or you don't know the thoughts of God on it. Though a thousand shall fall at my side. Here's, you, you, you want to know, be dominated by the thoughts of God? We talk about Psalms 91. Though a thousand shall fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, it shall not come near me. Well, you're saying, well, I, I know a lot of bad things happen. Look how the disciples died and everything. Well, you know, I'm not going to look back and judge what God did based upon what someone else did not receive. Because I don't know who chose and who didn't choose. You understand? So the whole thing is, I've watched people, I've watched people see their faith shaken because so and so did not get healed. I I I remember one particular. I'm not going to mention now. Angel and I were uh, were sitting at a lunch table the other day t- talking about it. Uh, a person that was healed and walked out of it once and went back into it again, and I knew in my heart they were going to heaven the next time. I knew in my heart they were going to heaven. And it's not because God wasn't going to heal them again. They'd already resigned to the fact that heaven's a whole lot better than being right here. They already resigned to it. But yet, out of not wanting, because you're still in the natural mind and natural body, not wanting people to hurt, you'd say, it's going to be all right. I'm, I'm going to come out of it. Don't worry. And because they had such a robust faith, they had such a robust faith, but they don't want children to hurt they don't want the spouse to hurt they don't want other people to hurt they'll say things like don't worry because they're not worried don't worry i'm going to come out of this and all of a sudden when they go on to heaven because they know they've already resigned to the fact everybody's saying oh my god if that person can't get healed how can we get healed but you don't know the heart of man the only person knows the heart of man is the spirit of god but i know the heart of god that he came to seek and to save that which was lost and to give life and light. 
And I know that God did not plan your life for destruction. He plans your life to be blessed. He plans you to be empowered. He planned for you to live long and strong. He planned for you to fulfill the destiny in your life. That's why inside of me, I constantly want to tell people on, on how they can walk greater in this realm of walking in God and walking in him, being in him, in Christ. How to live a life of the spirit and how they can reach their destiny. I don't want to be the only one that, uh, I don't want to be one that preaches to a, a people about how God spoke to me and how God worked it out for me to actually fulfill what he called me to do, but not be concerned about how you're going to fulfill what he called you to do. I mean, I, I'm very interested in you being everything God called you to be. Not everybody's going to do what I do. Not everybody is going to be a, a pulpit guide. Not everybody's going. But, you know, if it wasn't for people called to work in all the areas of this church, from the nursery all the way up to this pulpit, from the parking lot people out there. You, how many saw somebody in the parking lot this morning? Come on. You, you, you think they're out there just because they want to be on hot, steamy days? You know, they still have suits on in the summer. And it's cold in the winter. They're not out there just because... They're told to, hopefully not. Hopefully they're out there because they understand that we're the first point of somebody seeing us. And that we can actually show love and speak a word. And some people, that they're just, they're just called to serve. Look at the seven motivational gifts. They're just called to serve. That's their heart. And God will bless you and prosper you, provide for you. And take you from here to there, wherever you want to be, just because you follow and obey everything he called you to do. You don't have to be a preacher to be blessed. You are a preacher. Your, your, your life is going to preach. Your, your life, uh, what God's done for you is going to preach. But you don't have to be a, a preacher to be blessed. Well, you preachers, everybody gives to you. Everybody gives, you know, you, you guys always get a hit. No, you don't have to do that. God will promote you right where you're at. He already designed you to be blessed. He already designed you to be that way. You just got to walk and believe that I'm not going to stay where I'm at. That's why I like to quote, I'm the head, not the tail. I'm above and not beneath. I'm the victor. I'm not the victim. One thing that beats you out of it is getting that victim mentality. Woe is me. As soon as you start thinking nobody cares Pastor doesn't care. Nobody cares. You know, I don't understand why nobody cares. Uh, you're, you're, you're not going to survive it. Or as soon as you allow a critical spirit get up on you because it's not the way you like it, doesn't go to the way you think it should go. Let me tell you what. What may seem to be just a simple conversation to you, if it's really being critical in your heart, the enemy will use that against you and it will just continue to drive you away further and open the door for, for greater attacks. You, you got to keep the door. You're saying, how do you know that? Because I know the heart of God. I know what his word declares. I know what his word declares. And so what we have to do is continue to walk and allow God to use us and fulfill the destiny he has in our life. And I, I don't believe that we can use the, the thing forever that well, I, I want it, but man's holding me back. Let me tell you, God's got a way to put you there. If so-called you feel man's holding you back. Don't, don't, don't allow the enemy to, to do that to you. You just believe God that, that I'm going to be able to, to do this. God's going to make a way. God's got a pathway already prepared. When the, when the Israelites were standing at the Red Sea, all they saw was water. All they saw was water. All they heard was the Egyptian army behind them. And what some of them wanted to do was find another pastor besides Moses to take them back to Egypt. There'll always be somebody to take you back to bondage. I mean, they're recruitable. They'll take you back to bondage. There's no doubt about it. But God told Moses... And as a stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. They didn't get born again because of salvation. The salvation was delivered. Stand still and watch me deliver. God opened up the Red Sea and they walked over on dry land. That path just didn't 
create itself right then. God already had the pathway prepared. Even though you can't see it, don't say it's not there. It's already prepared. In the presence of mine enemies, he's already prepared me a table. Just because you can't see it, it doesn't mean it's not there. Just because you can't see how you're going to get to the next level, doesn't mean the pathway isn't already there. You see it by walking in him and walking in the spirit to get there. God wants you there. He planned it for the foundation of the world for you to be there. You just got to walk with him. Got to walk with him. And let God be God in your life. I remember sitting over here about where I think I'm sitting in the same seat Tim's sitting in. Now the pew may not be the same pew because all this lights and stuff, they've been shuffled around like, like dominoes. But about the third row back, there's a guy here preaching, Pastor Rothwell had preaching here, and I'll never forget it. I remember telling Pastor Barkley about this one day. And uh, I was, uh, I was I, uh, Angel and I were married, so it wasn't, it's in the last 25 years. And, uh, and this guy was preaching, and I kept saying, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. And I was, close, I was going to close my Bible. I, I don't agree with that either. And to be honest with you today, some of it I still don't agree with. But that's not the point. The point was I kept saying, I don't agree with that. And it started bugging me. And I remember the Spirit of God rose up inside me. You don't agree, you, you, you don't agree because he's wrong or you just don't have the understanding he has? What I did not say is, I don't agree with that at that point in time. I judged my heart right then. I quit judging what he was saying because I judged my heart. Sometimes we disagree with something. It may not be wrong. It's just we don't understand what he understands and what he's trying to, to relate. And I was sitting there allowing this to get into my heart to where I was going to close out everything. And at the end of it, God may have one nugget for him to say to put me on my next destination, my next course, and I would have missed the whole thing because all I could say is, I don't agree with that. So to keep me out of the realm of danger, the Spirit of God, however it came, said you don't agree because he's wrong or because you don't have the light that he has on it. And I remember that was not a correction, that was a rebuke. Stop it. And I'll never forgot that. And any time that starts to get up inside of me, I remember that and I stop it. Because there may be one phrase in there for God wanting to help me take that next step. That I'm sitting there saying, you know, I'm really, I'm really wondering on, on what, what this next move is. And all it takes is just an open heart for that to happen. You know, God's trying to get us there. The enemy's trying to blockade you from getting there. Our weapons, our, our warfare is not flesh and blood. But there's a real enemy of the soul that tries to keep you out. And I know there's nothing, I think, more heartbreaking is somebody in their older years feeling like they never got to do what God called them to do. I never wanted to. And if you feel that way, I'm going to pray that God somehow supernaturally allows you to step into and to see because I believe it's God's will for people's hearts to be fulfilled unless sin has put you in a place to disqualify you out of it. Outside of that, I believe God wants everyone to be able to do that and understand the thoughts I have towards you. Not of evil, but of good. But to give you an expected end. A hope and an end. Don't live your life feeling like I have no purpose. Always know that God's prepared a beautiful future for you. Amen. Something beautiful. There was a, there was a song years ago. Something beautiful. Something good. All of my confusion, 
he understood. But God was able to take a life full of brokenness and strife and make something beautiful out of it. So the truth is, don't judge your future based upon where you're at today. You get that thing sorted out with God and you walk with God. Because these last days, we need the church together and we need the army strong. Amen. Because we're not walking in circles. We're not going to keep walking around Mount Sinai. We're going to keep moving to everything that he's provided for us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand together.